Welcome back to another episode of the Royals Farm Report podcast. My name is Alex Duvall. If I sound like I have peanut butter in my nostrils, it is because I feel that way. Um, it is allergy season, baby. It is baseball season, but it is allergy season. So I'm sorry for sounding like a snot-nosed kid with braces. Um, anyway, Joel is back tonight. Joel made it through the hurricane slash tornado that he drove through in Oklahoma last week. Joel, it's good to see you again. Um, you got to go see the double-A team last week. You got to see Turnpike Troubadours, and you're going to the Royals game tomorrow. Is Could your life be moving any faster at the moment? Uh, no, I just really like there to be more wins and less one nothing losses when Zach Grinky pitches. Like well, We talk about time moving fast. It's 2009 all over again, man. It is literally 2009. I saw this, somebody named Sam Griffin uh, tagged us in a picture on Twitter, and it was from 2000 and I don't know, eight, maybe 2008, 2009. I just wish the Royals would support Granky. It's like, God, it's, <laughs> some things just never end. As, just, as the great prophet, Matthew McConaughey would say, time is a flat circle. It flat is a circle. flat circle. Josh, right, how are we doing? All right. Uh, I kind of in the same boat as, uh, as both you guys, both the uh, whirlwind of life that, that is uh, the Kaiser household is, is, is definitely at our present tense, but uh, also not feeling great. Uh, I woke up with a sore throat the other day and I just kind of been battling that, but uh, I'm happy to be here with you fellas. It's, 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 I could not be more excited to be here. Let's talk some Royals. Bunch of tough SOBs, toughing it out for the fans. So it's a there flu game for us. We, we we're here you. for the content. We are here, we are here for the content. We're here for you, <laughs> even if you don't want us to be here. Uh, but really quick, also here for all of us is Kansas city strength and conditioning, our title sponsor for the 2022 season. Let's hear a quick word from KCSC. From the beginning, we knew right away that we wanted to do strength conditioning and a throwing program for the baseball and softball community. It wasn't something we were trying to back into or all of a sudden learn. We knew we were really good at these coaching these skills from the get-go. And the fact that we're in the same business and the employees are all on the same page, you know, we can write a program based off of what a kid needs, not just getting him stronger or faster from a general sense. It's what does this kid need? On the pitching end, we can say, hey, this kid needs such and such. He needs to do this or that better. A lot of times it turns out it's not something that needs to be fixed in the baseball cage or on the throwing mound. It actually needs to be fixed in the weight room. That guy has some immaculate forearm veins. Sure does. I notice that every time that video plays. So if you want to look like that, go to Kansas City Strength and Conditioning out at Home Field in Olathe. There's nobody better to send your kid to for baseball training, softball training. And and I mean, as a high school coach here in the Kansas City area, I mean, that there's nobody better right now. So thanks to KCSC for picking up the podcast this year. Gentlemen, MJ Melendez, the heir to the Salvador Perez throne, has been called up he was in the big league dugout for the game against the cardinals today i presume he'll be in the dugout for the game against the cardinals tomorrow so when you're listening to this it'll be tuesday i'm assuming that as soon as we see a right-handed starter he's going to be in the lineup whether it's at dh or catcher or otherwise how excited are you scale of one to ten joe you're going to the game tomorrow to to potentially see the the debut of mj melendez yeah, it just happened to work out that way. I'm super excited that he's up. It's, you know, a long time coming for him and uh, didn't look like this would even be a thing in 2019. So to, for him to now, you know, two years later after the incredible season he had last year, uh, to have the opportunity to come up in the big leagues and fill in for Cam Gallagher, who's now on the injured list, uh, with the opportunity to make his his first start here soon, and he might do that. Dakota Hudson's on the mound tomorrow for st louis or today i guess for st louis that's a righty maybe you throw him in there and just see what he's got and i i hope that they do that i don't want them to just let him sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there until maybe he pit plays on sunday you know the night game or the day game after a night game where salvi usually dhs that would not be ideal for his development i don't think he continues to need the at-bats and I want to see him in the lineup, especially since I'm going to the game. Like that would be awesome. Get a little little standing O from a, a Tuesday night crowd at the K. Let's let's go for it. I was looking at his numbers again, and they weren't great. He's only hitting a buck sixty seven, but that's on a two oh four Babip. So he's having a little bit of of bad luck there. And and I've seen the games. He hits the ball pretty hard, 
pretty consistently. I think it's a matter of figuring out that plane, the the more most efficient launch angle, if you will, to hit more line drives. And it's also a bit of he's striking out a little bit, not not a ridiculous amount. He's still walking 14% of the time, which is great. He's still got a 128 ISO, which suggests he is hitting the ball at least relatively hard. The I, I made the point on Twitter that Sebastian Rivero has big league time. He's still in the 40-man roster. He could have easily been there today. And the fact that they went with Melendez over Rivero should be a vote of confidence for how they feel about Melendez at the moment, that he's ready, that he's willing to take this step, or he's, he's going to be able to take this step and, and be successful. Somebody then replied, two people replied on Twitter. And then I said, well, not just two people, but I saw two themes on Twitter. Number one, if they would have called up Rivero instead of Melendez, people would have rioted. And the second thing I saw on Twitter was, is Melendez even ready? He's hitting a buck 67. So it's like the Royals couldn't win, right? They call up Melendez and it's, oh, well, he's not even hitting. But if they would have called up Rivero, who is hitting at double A, by the way, and hitting well, Oh my mm-hmm. gosh, why didn't they call it Melendez? So mm-hmm. I thought that was funny. Like the the two themes were so polar opposites, but I am excited. Melendez is awesome. I I went back and I found that article. I ran it on Twitter today. The the heir to Salvador Perez's throne, where I interviewed MJ's dad, Mervil, when MJ was drafted back in 2017. And one of the first articles I ever wrote at Royals Farm Report that talked about how MJ Melendez was being overlooked in that 2017 draft. He fell to the second round strong commitment to FIU. And I was like, I don't know what people are talking about when they say he might not hit for power. He has the bet. He had the best bat speed in that draft class. And then last year, of course he leads minor league baseball and home runs. Joel, we talked, um, I can't remember who you were talking about, but you had a great take on someone preseason. And you said, you mentioned that it feels good to be vindicated. Then after Melendez struggled in 2019, it felt good to be vindicated last year as he came on, led the minor leagues in home runs. It's just like, uh, like a yeah, like let's go. So I'm pumped up. And Josh, you've got a little something, something for us as it relates yeah. to Melendez's time in the big leagues. I think this would be a very interesting exercise. I love coming up with these games, and this is a very original one by me. A bunch of over unders here for you, but I, I just wanted to kind of get your temperature on what you kind of expect out of this Melendez call up. Uh, how you know how they're going to treat it for length of time, where he'll play, what he'll do when he does play. So I got a, I got some interesting here uh over unders i want to get your vibes on so let's go plate appearances first and i'm going to set the line at 30 and a half 30 before and he a half gets sent back down before he gets sent back down this stint over i'll over. say over over what's I the think, reasoning i think he's here i think i think if he has any semblance of success i don't think he goes back down mm-hmm. yeah so yeah, i'm, I'm gonna say it. over because for for obvious reasons yeah it kind of feels that way like how many dudes are really hitting in the Royals lineup right now? It yeah. can't hurt to just put him out there and see what sticks, right? Well, it could hurt his development, I think, is the main argument by that. I mean, if he's striking out totally 40% of that. the time, then sure. But yeah. if, he stri- if he keeps his strikeout right between 25 and 30% and he's walking above 10%, which he's done for the last couple of years, yeah. gets a, you know hits some doubles, hits, hits a couple over the wall, then there's yeah. no reason to not have him in the lineup at least three to four times a week. And I, I would contend we talked a little bit about in the chat, like the middle infielder depth is not very much there now. It's just Wit, Wit, and Nikki, basically the shortstop second baseman combos that you can have there. Wit got a little dinged up over the weekend. Nikki got a little dinged up over the weekend. So it seemed like a little bit of depth was going to be in question. Melendez can now play third. So you got him and Dozier potentially being able to slate in a third if there's an injury. Um, so I think that's also a, a, you know an outlet for that as well. Did they move the IL back to 15 days yet? I think it's still I don't 10. think so. I think it's, it's still 10. 10. Okay. That that would have made a difference because if it was 15, yeah. that's two weeks worth of games. Let's say there's 11 games. He plays in 10 of them. That's that's 31 right there. So right. maybe at 30 and a half is actually a really good number now that I think about it. But I really believe if he has any semblance of success that he'll stay. The problem is, like Joel mentioned, that it, there could be some strikeouts and there's going to be an adjustment period. The yep. Royals as a whole right now are swinging entirely too much. So mm-hmm. if he gets caught into that trap, I could see him going back down. So I'm a little less confident about the over than I was a few minutes ago, but I'm still going to roll with the over. Okay. So along the same lines about, you know, his playing time, let's go with innings that he plays that are not at either catcher or designated hitter. 
So with him, the natural possibilities are third base, right field, had some highlights there in Omaha and right field. So uh, it does look okay out there, but I'm putting the over under at 10 and a half in this stint. Over was, under on 10 and a half. I didn't know if you were going to give us a number and I was going to put it at nine and a half. So right yeah. along the same lines there, I will go under. I don't think yep. he plays much of anything but catcher DH. Yeah, I'll go under. Could be like maybe a late game sub situation in right field or third, but I don't think he plays a full game there. I do think it's interesting that they sent Rivera down because unless they're going to move Dozier back to third base, is Melendez the, I don't want to say obvious, but the resident backup third baseman now too? Right. Yeah, I mean that was that was a weird call for me, anyways, because a you still have Ryan O'Hearn taking up a spot on there. If you're calling up a left-handed bat, in Melendez, you don't need a left-handed bat anymore. So, I don't know. This is what it is, I guess. That that I thought the Rivera thing was interesting because I, I know we had talked about that that idea that he could play other positions, and my instant reaction was, well, no. But the more I think about it, I mean, if if Wit does anything, Whit, Bobby Witt Jr. in terms of missing a day. Mm-hmm. Then the the next third baseman you're talking about Dozier or Melendez, which I'm not super thrilled about the idea of Melendez <laughs> playing third base in the big leagues, but I would rather the see him play Dozier. Dozier so. Yeah, <laughs> I get that for sure. So we were talking about the walk rate, K rate, and all that stuff. We're going with the OPS, and as of today, his AAA OPS was 581. So that's where I'm setting it for his stint in the majors, 581. Joel, you go first this time. Over, because I think he is going to hit a couple. Show, I think he's going to get a couple show homers early. Hmm. I could see like it. It. He, he feels like the type of dude that would go like if he pl- say he plays today against St. Louis goes goes and bops one over the right field wall mm-hmm. and like one of the first or second at bat. Maybe I'm optimistic, but he just kind of feels like he would find a way to get his a swing off and find it. Yep. I was going to say sense. over two like right away because. It just feels like one of these guys is due to come up and like have a like a like a spark, right? And just all of a sudden be really, really good. And it's like, oh my God, is MJ Melendez gonna win rookie of the year? And then he will inevitably cool off and plateau and and you know, maybe long term, if you wanted to set it like six fifty, I'd say he settles in and struggles eventually. But mm-hmm. I could see him. I'm just gonna flip a coin and say he gets off to a blazing hot start for no reason, and then will inevitably cool off. I don't think he's going to go Shohei Otani on us or anything crazy. But mm-hmm. I do. And that think was part probably, of the – go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no I was just going to say, I do think there's a shot that he starts off on a blazing start here. Mm-hmm. I was going to kind of spin zone that the bad, bad numbers in Omaha because if he was setting the world on fire, the expectations are super high. When he takes his first round of at bats here, take. so if That's he struggles, take. he's going to get like the, he, the the fans will riot, if you will. So now you got the expectations are already tampered, and so he's got to you know just kind of got a clean state way more, way more so than like Bobby Witt debuts or Daniel Lynch debuts or Jackson Coar debuts. And there's just a lot more expectations when you're dominating when you get called up. So. I, I can kind of see I'm spinning and spinning that a little bit, but uh, but I can certainly see the silver lining in it. Next one here out of these three guys who has the most plate appearances while Men- Melendez is up between him, Isbell, and Oliveris. Alex, Ooh, that's, that's good. Um, Ooh. Olivares got four today, mm-hmm. let off. Yeah, so Olivares got four today. Oh man. Let's let's wipe today's that's, that's clean. Let's, let's wipe it today, starting tomorrow or today. Today's game. What do you got? Can I say they all get the same amount? <laughs> if you really want to kiss your cousin, how about this? How about this? I will say that Melendez gets as many as Isbell and Olivares combined. Oh, interesting. Okay, like I don't think he'll get more, but like I think those two are in, in a semi-permanent platoon role. And I think Melendez will play. So I think, actually, how about this? I think Melendez gets more than those two, but I think those two combined get more than Melendez. Okay. Is that fair? Like yep. Melendez is the, is the answer there, but I like the caveat. Joel? Okay. I think I'm going to go with Kyle Espel here because I do think we are getting closer and closer to him actually playing 
regularly, if not every day. Yeah. Well, so we'll we'll see. But I'll okay. go I'll go Kylo Spell. And then over under on how many times Hudler talks about him going oppo in his at bats because MJ loves to go opposite field. The over limit does not exist. Twenty thousand and five and a half. The limit does not exist. I'm excited to see that uh, that talk. I, I want to see how his approach kind of translates to major league ready. So I'm I'm excited will, to see. I'm at like a nine and a half for a Melendez coming up. What will HUD talk about more? The fact that Melendez's dad is a college coach, or the fact that Melendez likes to go oppo? Ooh, that's a good question. The limit does not exist. My answer stays the same. I'm gonna say oppo, but the ca- the coach caveat is gonna get run 100. percent That's awesome. Okay. We're going to do things a little bit differently this week because we have an awesome interview for you guys on the other side of of this first half here. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to run through the minor league minute as fast as I can do it solo. And then we're going to do player awards and weekly awards for for the guys on the show. And then we're going to have Robbie Glendening on on the on the back half of this. So uh, the minor league minute this year is brought to you by Drum Farm, the Drum Farm Center for Children is a foster care facility out on Lee Summit Road. They do awesome work taking care of foster families, but also their Compass program takes care of kids who have aged out of the foster care system. So it's a wonderful facility they got going on out there. Uh, Thank you so much to Drum Farm and their supporters for hooking us up this year and being a part of the show. So without further ado, let's get in the minor league minute. Down in Columbia, down in low A, the Fireflies got no hit yesterday on Sunday. They have been very well, they've been bad of late. Uh, they have lost 12 of their last 16 games after winning three of their first five. I saw something on Twitter today that the average strikeout rate in low A is over 27%. So that it's not just Columbia that is struggling. I will say uh, Samuel Valerio had a good week. He had a good start. John McMillan lowered his mm-hmm. season ERA to 1.5. He's got 11 strikeouts in six innings. He looks like he could be that reliever we always thought he could be when he was signed in 2020. So Columbia has not had a very good run of late. They are returning home this week. I don't remember who they play host to, but they are returning home from Myrtle Beach this week starting tomorrow or tonight, I guess. Uh, Quad Cities, after losing seven games in a row, Quad Cities has won five of their last seven. They will hit the road this week to take on Cedar Rapids. Tyler Tolbert, who is our weekly MVP, we'll get to that in a minute. Tyler Tolbert finished two for four with a seven-game hit streak. He hit 464 in that seven-game hit streak and has been lights out in the field as well. He's got nine total stolen bases on the year. He's starting to hit a little bit. I mentioned that he could be somewhere between like Terrence Gore and Gerard Dyson, where like Terrence Gore didn't play at all. He just pinch ran, and Gerard Dyson played a lot, but he was like that pinch runner early. I think Tyler Tolbert fits in the middle somewhere where he's a defensive all-star. He can run like crazy, and the bat will be good enough to get him in at bat like every once in a while, like you maybe not automatic pinch hit for him, but probably not a regular starter, kind of like Dyson was for a bit in his career. So Quad Cities had a good week, winning five of their last seven. They return or they hop on to Cedar Rapids this week. Northwest Arkansas, Michael Massey has gone absolutely <laughs> berserk. Or should I say in the wise words of, well, I guess it wasn't Nicholas Batters who said it. He credited somebody else, but Michael Mashey, uh, five home runs. He hit 405 in his last nine games. Five home runs, four doubles, and a 214 weighted runs created plus. He has gone absolutely bonkers in his last couple of games. Uh, Drew Parrish made two starts this week, two total earned runs in 11 innings, 10 strikeouts, zero walks. Those are my pitchers and hitters of the week, by the way, Massey and Parrish. So we have hit the roundabout for me. We will get to these two gentlemen here in a minute. Robbie Glendening, who we're going to have on. Had a great game on Sunday, two for three, a home run, a double, a walk. Robbie Glendening down in double A is, well, hang on. Oh, man, I lost his stats. I was going to try to do this fast. Uh, Robbie Glendening is hitting 315 with a 176 weighted runs created plus a 315 ISO. He is clobbering the baseball. Can't wait to talk to him um, and his Australian. I hope he has an Australian accent. And I actually talked to the guy. Uh, so, so we'll see. Uh, but in Omaha, the Bash brothers, Vinny Pasquantino and Nick Prado, um, couldn't help themselves but smash balls over the wall all week. So Vinny Pasquantino's now got four home runs. Nick Prado's now got five. MJ Melendez got called up. So 
that team will look a little bit different this week, but they have been um, hot of late. Omaha has got their record back to 11 and 12. We'll look to get back to 500 this week as they return home. Um, I don't remember who they're playing, but they were just on the, no, I'm sorry. They will hit the road. They were just hosting Toledo. They will hit the road this week. So MJ Melendez is up. Brady Singer is down. Prado and Pasquantino are still hitting. Um, so there's your minor league minute. Thanks to drum farm for the minor league minute. I know that was quick. Um, I mentioned that I have Michael Massey and Drew Parrish as my player and pitcher of the week. Tyler Tolbert, Tyler Tolbert this week. Hang on. I texted you guys his weekly numbers. I've got them yeah. right. Oh no. Come on. Load, 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 load. Tyler Tolbert this week, week 526 with a 609 on base, a 737 slug, a 1346 OPS, a 275 weighted runs created plus three extra base hits, two stolen bases. That man does it all. Um, that is our MVP of the week, Tyler Tolbert, after – who was it last week? Nick Lofton and then Nick Prado. The week it was River that. Towns last week. Oh, that's right. It was River Town last week. He so blew up. It's been Nick Prado, Carter Jensen, River Town, and now uh, Tyler Tolbert. So there Vinny's you go. has been runner-up like minute. every week. <laughs> yeah, Vinny has been the runner-up every single week. So, Josh, really <laughs> quick, who are your pitcher and player of the week? Uh, pitcher, I got Emilio Marquez for Quad Cities. He made two appearances versus South Bend Cubs, went five and two-thirds, one earned, uh, six hits, one walk, and nine strikeouts. Uh, n- I don't know about his long-term value as a prospect, only 5'8", 170, and his fastball sits around 89, 90, but, boy, he spins it apparently because he was generating a whole lot of weak contact. So, Emilio Marquez, hats off to you for your performance out of the bullpen in Quad Cities. Uh, player of the week for the batters is Sebastian Rivero down in double A, 1452 OPS and 16 at bats with three dingers, two doubles and six ribs. Currently carrying an 875 OPS and 59 at bats this week. So I'm going to keep an eye on him to see what happens uh, if he goes to Omaha or if they're cool with Freddie Fermin there in Omaha. Um, but I'll be keeping an eye on what Sebastian Rivero kind of goes through the next couple of weeks. But uh, had a hell of a week this week. So keep it going, baby. Joel, player and pitcher of the week. All right, pitcher of the week, I'm going with Samuel Valero. Valerio, you mentioned him a little bit ago for Columbia. Four innings, three strikeouts, one unearned run this week uh, against Myrtle Beach. Has season ERA down below two now. So he's he's been pitching pretty well, not walking as many guys as he did early on in the season. It's only 20 years old in, in low way, and he's still got a pretty projectable body. He's, he's 6'4", 230, and he's 20 years old. So there, there's still a lot of projectability there. My hitter is uh, pl- played his first games of the season, so our Peyton Wilson. Uh, there in uh, in high A Quad Cities, one forty nine WRC plus on the week. Couple homers uh, slashed. Let's look at two seventy eight, three thirty three, six eleven. Good for a nine forty four OPS. I like what I like what I see in him. He's super tooled up. So hopefully he can stay healthy and keep it rolling. All right, there are pitchers and players of the week. Our MVP of the week and the minor league minute brought to you by Drum Farm. So Josh is going to hop out really quick. Robbie Glendening is going to jump in. And we will be right back with an interview on the other side of this. All right. We are now joined by Royals. What, what do we even call you? You're a utility prospect, right? I mean, what is your, if you had to pick a position, Robbie, what is your position of choice um, in, in baseball? Yeah. So actually um, I've been a shortstop my whole life. Um, I signed as a shortstop. I played the most innings at shortstop. Um, but then, obviously, once I got to the Royals, we got some pretty good prospects at shortstop. So, wherever they can get me in the lineup, third base, first base, I can play second. So, all four in the infield, I can play. So, Royals infield prospect and Robbie Glendening. Robbie has quite the story that I am pumped up to to learn about tonight. Robbie, you are from Perth, Australia. Mm-hmm. You played college ball at Mizzou and West Virginia. Yep. And then, now you you've played in the Australian Baseball League. And then now you are playing for the Royals down there in Double A. Your first exp- your first go at professional baseball and, and affiliated baseball is all the way up to Double A. So I am pumped up to hear this story. I want to start with your introduction to the. You know what? Let's let's go backwards, Joel. I, I sent you a list of things I wanted to get into. Let's go backwards, Robbie. I want to hear your introduction to baseball in Australia. So I think a lot of Americans are familiar with the fact that there is an Australian baseball league. I'm willing to bet that not many Americans are familiar with the Australian baseball league beyond that. So tell us a little bit about baseball in Australia. How popular is it? 
How many people do you think play? And what is what was it like growing up playing baseball in Australia? Yeah, I mean, it's different. So um, growing up in Australia, baseball is probably the eighth or ninth most popular sport. Um, popularity, obviously, has cricket, Australian rules football, you know, rugby. Those are the big sports. So growing up, we didn't play a lot of games. I only grew up playing around 16 games a year. Um, but we had teams and we had, as I got older and more into my teenage years, we had trips and guys that gave us exposure into colleges and um, baseball worldwide and in America. Very cool. So you played your first, <clears throat> excuse me, you came over to the United States to go to college. What was the, Mizzou wasn't your first college, was it? No, yeah. So I went to junior college um, at a place called Nyack, North Iowa Area Community College. So I went from Perth, Western Australia, which is nice, nice climate, coastal to the middle of Iowa. So that was a bit of a change for me. <laughs> what what you, was your first like culture shock moment in the U.S. just in general with like any it could be anything? So I actually had a coach growing up. His name was Steve Fish. He played uh, professional baseball. He's big in the college scene. He moved out to Australia. He played there as a player and then ended up staying over there because he loved it so much. And he would bring trips every year for high school kids to play on the West Coast and play up um, against high school teams. So I did that maybe my junior and senior year of high school for four weeks in the summer. We'd come play and we'd play about 20 to 30 games. He thought the biggest thing was getting game exposure for Australians. So I had actually come out prior in America. Um, and that's where I got recruited to my junior college. So I, I'd say the biggest culture shock. Um, really, it's it's really similar. They're both Western countries. They're both pretty modern. And, you know, I would say I was in California and I got a burrito um, in Anaheim and they were only $2. So I thought they must be tiny. And I got like four of them. And they were these massive burritos. I would say that was that was a culture shock when I first got over if there are anything like the burritos that I got at a street car in Santa Cruz one time, I know what you're talking about. And I was, okay, so long, you know what, never mind. I was going to get into a story about Tex-Mex versus like California Mexican food, but we don't need to do that right now. Do you, Robbie, what is like, so in terms of maybe not culture shock, but in terms of like food differences, what has been your favorite like food that you've encountered in America? Maybe you didn't have in Australia. So this is actually going to be pretty popular. So I actually live in Kansas City uh, with my girlfriend that I met at Mizzou. And I'm actually in Kansas City now for the off day. Um, I drove up from Arkansas. But I would say Kansas City barbecue is pretty good. So That is a great answer. Popular, but I really enjoy a good barbecue. Well, that's how you endear your yourself to this fan base. Well done. That yeah. is 1,000% how you do it. What's your favorite spot? Don't mess this one up. So my favorite spot in uh, Kansas City is actually an Italian place called Chemeca's. Um, it's in North Kansas city, a nice little like Italian meat market that we know the owners of that we, I like to go to. My favorite barbecue place would be Q39, which is pretty standard, but I mean, you can't go wrong. That's a fine answer. That's a fine answer. So you get to Mizzou. What did you play for Jameson or Steve Beezer? I committed to Jameson and then I played in Beezer's first year. Okay. So you were there Beezer's first year. Yeah. So I actually want to ask you about the, the, the college baseball experience you go from playing, like you said, 16 games in Australia to coming to California, playing 20, 30 games. You go to a Juco in Iowa and all of a sudden you're playing sec baseball against some of the best of the best in terms of college ball in the, in the world. What was the biggest adjustment you had to make? And, and, and I want to talk to you about adjustments you made from college ball to double a as well. But just in getting into the SEC, what was the biggest adjustment you make, the biggest baseball shock that you experienced going into the SEC? Yeah, the SEC is a different beast. I would say just the um, the environments every Friday, Saturday night. Um, we had a big, we had Tanner Houck on our team, who was a big star for Mizzou, and just the Friday nights when he would pitch on an away game at Ole Miss. The, those were uh, those memories that last a lifetime. And we have a couple of SEC guys on our team now, Tucker Bradley, um, probably a couple others that I um, can think about. But we talk about how cool the SEC is, and there's really nothing like it in college baseball. You played in the Big 12 as well at West Virginia. Nick Lofton played at Baylor there in the Big 12. 
how would you compare? And obviously, Double A and the SEC and Big Twelve are, are different. But when it gets when it, when you go from the SEC to the Big Twelve to Double A, what have been the biggest baseball adjustments you've had to make? Is is you know the is the toughest thing the the velocity adjustment where everybody's throwing ninety five all of a sudden? Is it the breaking balls? Is it pitchers' ability to locate? What's been the biggest like adjustment you've had to make to pitchers as you've moved through the levels? So actually, I spent one year at Mizzou, and then the Pirates drafted me, and so I played short season ball at West Virginia. So I didn't. I didn't. Oh. To- <laughs> I was looking at your baseball reference page. It said West Virginia. Yeah. So <laughs> West. Virginia, so from twenty, I got drafted 2017, 2017 up until the start of spring training. I was with the Pittsburgh Pirates organization. <laughs> gotcha. So yeah. my bad. I, I, so okay. I want to go. Next, what, so what was that? You know, play one year of, of college ball there in Mizzou, and you get drafted by uh, Pittsburgh. It looks like twenty first round. What, yeah. what was that process like? In you know, kind of a, a long and kind of un, you know a little bit of an unorthodox journey getting to that point, playing in Australia and then coming over to the U.S. What was that whole whole day like for you, finding out you're going to go play professional baseball? Yeah, so it was awesome. And I tell people that I know that there's two happy people in the draft, the first pick and the last pick, right? So um, it was it was quite a stressful day a stressful couple days i remember the sec we started conference play and we played florida and i faced uh brady singer and jackson kowar and alex fiedo and then we went to vanderbilt and i think i went about two for 50 when sec play started so that kind of sunk me but i remember the draft being stressful but once you hear your name all those worries go away and you're just ready to get going that's awesome, man. I, so then during, I during those summers way. in between, or I guess, well, I guess it would be summer in Australia technically, but winter ball and as it goes in the States going back and you're playing for the Perth Heat in the Australian Baseball League, what was it like to kind of to go back home and, and play for your, your hometown team, so to speak? Yeah, it's awesome. So we all like to do it. Um, there's a couple of Australians. Um, Liam Hendricks is one. He grew up in the same town as me. And we all like to go back and play once we turn pro because – we grew up in the Perth Heat's all we had to watch, you know, kind of all the professionals playing that. So when you turn professional and you're able to play in that league, it's a, it's a great time. And um, I think I struggled my first year in professional baseball. I think I hit 190. And it was big for me to go back home and play against grown men in that Australian baseball league. Um, and I think that really propelled me for the next year and then to be have some success in professional baseball leading up um, from those summers. You're raking right now at Double A. This is your first go. No, not your first go. You were at Double A in 2019. Had a bit of success. Nothing like you've had right now. You had Tommy John and missed the la- last year in 2021. You were a minor league free agent, signed on with the Royals, back to Double A. All of a sudden, having a ton of success. What can you attribute some of the success to? I know, you know, if, if we're gonna nitpick something, maybe you're striking out a little more than you'd like to. But in terms of the, the the power production and your overall offensive production, what is what can you attribute that to in terms of maybe it's something the Royals did with you when you got to the system? Maybe this is the real you and we're finally getting a look at the real Robbie Glendinning. But you know, you give me what 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 can you attribute this success to? Because you are, I mean, 176 weighted runs created plus on base close to 500. I mean, anything specific you can you can point to for uh all the success you're having? One, I would say um, this COVID has been difficult for everyone, right? So 2019, if you look, I think I, I, had a, I had a really solid year. And I haven't gotten to play since then. So when you think about it, I had COVID. And then I went to play in Australia, did well, and was prepping for the championship series in Australia. And my elbow just snapped. So I haven't gotten to play professional baseball since then. So I've been, you know, biting at the bit to get back. So I had a lot of confidence from that 2019 season. I was just kind of waiting to show it. Um, My strikeouts aren't where they need to be. I know that. Um, I had Drew Saylor when I was with Pittsburgh. So that's right. That was a familiar face. And then Alan D. San Miguel, who's on the big league staff of the Royals, I grew up with. So I would say the biggest thing for me is the Royals have come in and just let me be me. Um, I've been fortunate to have some good hitting coaches in the past in college. My hitting coach is the Yankees hitting coach now in the big leagues. So 
I've had some guys that are pretty influential in the hitting world that I've been lucky enough to learn from. So I like to think that I know what I'm doing and it's been fun to just play, um, get out and be able to put up numbers because I haven't had that opportunity since 2019. So this, this is a little more of a philosophical question, but you see a, guy, a lot of times when guys have Tommy John or they're out for with a, a season ending injury that they learn more about themselves away from the game and kind of look, you know, kind of between the ears as the mental side of baseball. What were you able to learn about yourself during that time where you weren't able to play? Yeah, it was probably a blessing in disguise because I got to go back. I got to finish or not finish my school, but make some, um, you know, headway in my degree. My girlfriend and I, um, she works in Kansas City, so we get to spend a lot of time together because we're usually long distance. Um, and I got to be here and I got to focus on my rehab. Um, I got to fo- I got to rehab in Kansas City um, out at Legends with my trainer, Jason Yoda, there. And I really just got time away from the game to watch. And I, I was still learning while I was watching. I was watching all my friends in the Pirates organization and Australians throughout. So it's good to step away and watch – from a different point of view rather than being in it. Cause you can get caught up in the season. It feels like groundhog day every day. So it was fun to sit back and watch, obviously missing my age 24 and 25 season kind of weighed on me a little, but um, it's good to be back now for sure. You know, I didn't think about the fact that, um, y- that you played for sailor when, when you were in Pittsburgh. Um, I want to, I've got a clip queued up here. I want to show you the home run you hit the other day, but what every hitter we've talked to in the Royal system has raved about drew sailor. Mm-hmm. Is there anything specific that you could speak to that he helped you with, or maybe is, is drew sailor part of the reason that you chose to sign with the Royals and minor league free agency, but everybody else we've talked to has talked about how much they love drew sailor. I mean, how much, how much has he helped you in your development? I would say just the enthusiasm he brings every day. He's, he's never going to get, um, He's never going to get mad at you or anything like that. He's going to let you be you. And he brings a lot of enthusiasm every day to his work. In spring training, he works with us closely. Obviously, when the season started, he rose. And we have um, Nooney as our hitting coach who does a great job and works really hard. But I would say with Drew, just him letting me be me, right? So I have kind of an uphill swing. Um, He doesn't try to change me. I might swing and miss a little, but he knows I'll probably do some damage and and he gives me confidence. And I think that's the biggest thing for a hitting coordinator and just a hitting department in general is to give their hitters confidence. And I feel he does a great job of that. And he he'll explain to you why he wants you to do certain things. He has numbers to back up everything. He's a really smart guy and he just exhausts all options to get hitters better. I want to show for anybody watching us on YouTube who maybe hasn't seen Robbie swing a bat before, uh, Robbie, this is the home run you hit. I believe this is on Sunday. Okay. So, Robbie Glendinning bats to the first pitches, drilled down the left field line, into the corner, and gone. Okay, so let's run that back. I think I can rewind this pretty quick here. This is my first time sharing a clip, so if you're watching, I apologize for it being clunky. So, Robbie Glendinning bats to the first pitches, drilled down the left field line, into the corner, <laughs> All right, A, shout out to our guy, uh, Nicholas Batters, for what is an incredible call. Nicholas is one of my favorite uh, minor league uh, play-by-play guys that I've, that I've listened to. He is outstanding. B, Robbie, that is a was that a was that a fastball that was up, or was that a hanging breaking ball? It was a fastball, and Nicholas Batters, yeah, great guy. He came to Australia one year and uh, announced over there, so I knew him previously, too. He works hard at his job and he's great at it. But yeah, that was a fastball, um, fastball up and in. So the at bat before I got to full count, he gave me that same fastball up and in. So I was really, um, really just looking for something to pull. There was a runner on first. I wanted to hit something um, with some intent. So fastball up and in. Luckily, the wind was blowing out a little bit. So well, just you hit a line drive. What it was about three hundred and seventy feet over the fence. I mean, that is that is hitting the ball with authority. I, I can't help but wonder in, in a game where, in, like in cricket, did you grow up? Did you play a lot of cricket growing up? No, I didn't. Um, I played it a little bit just in, at school and stuff, but I was also I was always baseball. I had an older brother who played baseball. My dad used to sponsor the base oh the Perth Heat, um, so I was always around the game of baseball. So they kind of run hand in hand baseball and cricket. But no, I was always baseball. I played football too. Oh, you, you did play football. 
yeah, I, I played football growing up until kids got a little bigger and I was kind of a late developer. So <laughs> I, I get bullied too much, but you're not, uh, you're not yeah, getting was, bullied now. I mean, that was a, that was a line drive shot that you're able to shoot over the bullpen there. And we talked about earlier, I, I had kind of asked about velocity, the, the velocity that you face in the Australian baseball league, how does it compare to fastball velocity at double a? I wouldn't say it compares. I would say um, the league in Australia is more older guys on the kind of the back end of their careers that really know how to pitch. Um, and that's good because you don't want to be facing a hundred every day in the off season, you know, but um, it's guys that will know how to get you out and you really got to be locked in and learn how to hit. And I think that's where it's valuable. You got guys, Travis Blackley, who had a really uh, long career as an Australian, he comes back and pitches, throws a lot of cutters, sinkers. And I think that's a difference in double A for sure is that A ball, guys throw hard too. But once you get to double A, triple A, guys can cut and sink and throw different fastballs. And I think that's the biggest difference. That's outstanding. Did you have you so did you play in the Australian Baseball League last winter? Uh, there was it got canceled just it got to, canceled, but okay. I played in it the year before that. Yeah, in the year before that, was that how how long ago was it that the um, there was a there was a woman that made her debut in the Australian Baseball League? Is that uh, yeah. Uh, oh, G- Genevieve Beacon, I think her name was. Yeah. So that was part, at all? that wasn't um the actual league. It was kind of just like exhibition games, but gotcha. Yeah, that was uh. Some states were able to have it just due to COVID and um, different things. But, yeah, she she made a debut, yeah. Gotcha. So you, you have not faced her live? No, I haven't, no. Gotcha. I've been, I've been curious. I've, I've been wanting to get an update on her, but I haven't been it able was- to find one. So I was hoping maybe you could help us, but apparently not. I've heard, I've heard really good things um, about her from guys that I know that she's, um, she's legit. That's outstanding. That was that was a really cool moment, I think, on baseball social media, getting to see that for everybody. So um, I knew you had had played in the league, but that's that seems sounds like a little bit of a different scenario. So, um, Joel, you got anything else for Robbie? Well, I guess we talk a little bit about this. So I I, we, I mentioned this a little bit off air, but I have this kind of a weird affinity for Australian rules football. It's just such a, a fascinating and unique sport. If you've never watched it, probably because it's on at three in the morning here in the states, but. It's unlike any other sport you've ever seen. Did you play that at all growing up a little bit, or was that more just kind of like with friends, like you talk about playing like cricket and stuff? No, yeah, I, definitely, definitely. Everyone kind of plays that growing up. Um, so what baseball and American football is here, that's how big Australian rules football is over there. So um, in school you're playing, you're playing teammates and stuff. And I probably played until I was about 14 or 15. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great sport that really good athletes in that sport. Um, yeah. And I, it's a fast paced game. That's fun to watch. Absolutely. So who's your, who's your club? Uh, so Fremantle Dockers and the West coast Eagles are the two clubs in my home state of Western Australia. And I'd probably say I lean towards the West coast Eagles. Yeah. A little bit of a tough season this year. Hopefully they'll, uh, hopefully they'll turn it around a little bit, but yeah. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of those guys are either out or COVID related or stuff, but man, I, I saw they lost to, I think it was like Hawthorne by like 130 the other day. I was like, Ugh. yeah, they're not, they're not in too good a space right now, but historically they've been pretty good. So one, one last footy question we can, we can move on, but normally for those that don't know the grand final, which is like their super bowl, basically for Australian rules football is always at Melbourne cricket ground this past year due to COVID they moved it out West to Perth at off the stadium. Was that, was that pretty cool to see them kind of break tradition and have it, you know, in your hometown at one of the greatest stadiums I've ever, it's one of the coolest stadiums in the world. Um, yeah. Was that, yeah. was that kind of cool for you to see? Yeah, it was really cool to see. Um, cool to follow along. I know my friends back home, my family back home, they loved having it in Perth. Um, it was, it's obviously a massive spectacle. It's as big as a Super Bowl to Australians. So um, for, for them to move it from such a historic place like the MCG um, and have it in Perth. It was a big deal, and I know it was a great day for everyone there. Very That's cool. outstanding. That's really cool. I've I, I love listening to people connect different sports they played in in the different athletic backgrounds. So that's definitely the most unique we've had on the podcast so far. Yeah, there you go. Well, Robbie, I really appreciate you jumping on with us. I have been I've had so much fun watching you come in 
and just jump in and have all kinds of success with the Royals double A team. And it's interesting. You mentioned having played for coach Saylor before, because we've talked to coach Saylor twice on the podcast. We've talked to countless players about coach Saylor on the podcast. We are trying to get a zoom Walt Saylor presidential run going in 2024. Um, we're big fans here on the show. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I'd never put two and two together that he would have been a, a coordinator for you as well there in, in Pittsburgh. So he only was cool a little Berg too. And he's on big league stuff now. Um, yeah. Kearney, there, so yeah, I didn't think about that. That's, that's awesome, man. So really appreciate you coming on. Joel's got one last question. We ask everybody here before we get you out. So, of here. Yeah. So we, we hit this one with, with any, but any guests we've had on, uh, if you could go back, in time and watch any moment in baseball history live in person, what would it be? I would probably say Derek Jeter's 3000th hit. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Either Hold that, on. his last hit, the walk off. His last hit is just so perfect because it's a, he just served the ball to right center, which he'd made a living out of in his entire career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, was that, was that the guy growing up that you kind of like idolized? Yeah, so in Australia, um, I feel old saying this, but like back in those days when he played, uh, MLB Network wasn't around and we would only get ESPN Sunday night and Monday night baseball. So it was always the Yankees because they were popular back then. So it was always Derek Jeter, A-Rod, Teixeira. So yeah, I, I was a Jeter fan growing up for sure. That's Very awesome. Cool. Not a lot not a lot of better guys to emulate yourself after. Um Especially, and Joel mentioned it. I was like the most Jeter thing ever. His last hit. I remember where I was watching that game in my in a house I lived in in college, and it was like I had tabs on it, like on my phone, and then like like looking over, I was like, okay, Jeter's gonna get in at bat here. We better we better flip it over because I think I was watching the Royals game too. Flipped it over and like I, you talk about the most Jeter thing ever. That's that is an outstanding choice. Yeah, um, and I think that's the first time somebody said that on the podcast. I think so, so we got, yeah, we got no, we've had answer. Jeter mentioned before, but I think that was the first time we got the three thousand or the his last hit. I believe was yeah. the one of those first time we've gotten that one. Very yeah. cool. Well, Thanks. Robbie, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, well, hopefully, we'll have you, hope hopefully we will have you again on um, as we're approaching your big league debut, maybe later this summer. So appreciate it, man, right. and good luck to you. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. All right, big thanks to Robbie Glendening for jumping on the show. That was outstanding. I cannot believe I made the mistake of thinking that West Virginia meant <laughs> university. Like, I really thought when I when I was looking at his baseball reference page that West Virginia, like he had transferred to the University of West Virginia and was a Mountaineer after a year at Mizzou. No idea what I was thinking about there. I, I just, I don't know. So, anyway, uh, thanks to Robbie Glendening. The, the the point he made about Drew Saylor kind of makes me wonder, like in the back of my head is like, I wonder if Saylor like called him in. Like, I wonder if when he recovered from Tommy John, like Saylor made a phone call upstairs, like we need to go get this guy. Well, I mean, it's not entirely an aberration. Like he has an 803 OPS for his career. I mean, he, he really struggled there uh, in rookie ball. Other than that, I mean, he's he's been over 740 for, for most of his career and was really good there. Uh, in 2019 before COVID and before he got hurt. So we're kind of seeing everything kind of come together for him and wouldn't surprise me if he's knocking on the door, triple a is some more guys get called up here soon. Yeah. And and so we, we mentioned Emmanuel Rivera earlier. Let's say that Rivera for what, for whatever reason, let's say O'Hearn or Santana or somebody goes, they bring Rivera back up. Glendening very well could be the next infielder to Omaha. I mean, if you think about the rest of that infield, Michael Garcia going to need some more time. Nate Eaton needs some more seasoning. Who's playing second base for them? Um, I just drew a – oh, Matt Massey needs some more time. Mm -hmm. Glendening really could be the next guy they call up, especially if, like, Prado and Pasquantino are up in any capacity. Glendening could go up and play first base. So there's a chance he's, like you said, Joel, knocking down the door. Um, and, and if he's a Drew Saylor guy, then I'm in. That's the only yeah. – like vote of approval that I need. Josh, you were listening to the interview back in the green room. Is there anything that you took away from, from the interview and really caught your ear? 
It's the uh, the connections kind of jumped out to me. He's talked. He had multiple familiar faces there in Northwest Arkansas, and that was and within the organization. And I'm sure that's not a coincidence. I'm sure that's a big part of why he joined the Royals organization. But um, it is kind of cool to see you know those connections happening in the league, especially you know whether they're drafted by Pittsburgh or whether they're you know in Australian League or whatever. It's just kind of cool to see that they had familiar faces. Uh, to kind of, and he talked about batters, Nicholas Batters kind of being a familiar face. So just got a really, really cool small world type of thing, even though it is a baseball world, but it is kind of cool. Also, burritos. Uh, who knew that the scale of burritos was uh, was going to throw somebody off? But that, I remember like my first time at Chipotle being like, whoa, wh- what is this? So that, that's actually the thing in Australia. Like the portion sizes there are not as significant. Like, it's very, very different culturally. So that mm-hmm. when he said that, it made a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, now that we've got him out and we're not wasting his time anymore, have you guys been to California? Yes. Yes. That's where I had my first Chipotle. If you, had to, if you had to pick one and you could only eat one for the rest of your life, would you prefer like Tex-Mex or California Mexican food? I'd go Tex-Mex. I go, I go Tex-Mex. Yeah. So it's maybe it's just a, like, it, a, like a – Kind of like in and out is far away and it's hard to get to every like all the time. It's like a like a what do they call that? It's like a um, mecca. No, novelty. A novelty. There it is. There Thank you, go. Joel. Josh. Um, it's a novelty. Maybe California Mexican food to me is like a novelty because I can't just go get it all the time. Um, but I really think California Mexican food is one of the most underrated like foods in the country. Like you have like Kansas City barbecue, Texas barbecue. Tex-Mex, you have like seafood in the Northeast. California Mexican food is so good. It is so underrated, so underappreciated. Yeah. Um, so anyway, he he mentioned that, and I just started thinking, like, I'm hungry. I'm sitting here thinking about food now. So anyway. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy, so we were, no, ahead, we were uh, The one last thing on Glendening that I kind of – you guys talked about a little bit there was the depth and how he could potentially move up to Omaha – he spent a lot of time in spring training, and he was there late. Even when they mm-hmm. sent Prado down, they sent Melendez down. They obviously think pretty highly of him. Twenty six years old, so you got to think he's you know pretty close to his prime. Who's to say that if there's somebody goes down in the middle of the infield uh, for the big league club, he's still raking like he is now? Who's to say he's not the guy? Uh, he's he's certainly made a case. He's obviously seen a little bit more. Uh, than like a Michael Garcia or or Massey type. So maybe they think that he might be a little bit more major league ready and he gets the call. That would be rad to see him do that. So just well, something to think about. And it's not like he's got a ton of competition at Omaha. It's Angelo right. Castellano, Ivan Castillo, yeah, Gabriel Cancel. It's not I mean like it's not like there's a ton of guys at Omaha that are just blocking his path, right? Yeah. So if he does get to Omaha, the path for him to the big leagues is now the big league depth is deep. Right. I mean, I know Mondesi's out, but it's still Wit, Wit, and Nikki. Mm-hmm. There, there's a log jam there and two of your best first base prospects. Right. So there's a little bit of a log jam there. But beyond that, if God forbid something were to happen to those other three, you're mm-hmm. right. There's not. I mean, Ivan Castillo's probably ahead of him on that depth chart if you're just looking at the two of them. But I mean, really, at this point, what would you rather have? I've watched a lot of Glendening's at bats as we were prepping. Now, I, I will admit, I was maybe ignoring his production a little bit, thinking he's 26 and, you know, how much sure. attention should I pay to it? So I went back and watched 20 of his at-bats or so. He hits for some thump. Like, there mm-hmm. is a lot of mm-hmm. natural boom in his bat. Like, I didn't realize how big of a human being he was. Mm. I'm, I'm impressed. I actually did not expect to be as impressed as I was. And after watching, like, 20 of his at-bats, he puts good at plate appearances together. He draws a lot of walks, and I actually think some of those strikeouts are a byproduct of, man, he really just works good counts and then gets himself into, you know, the adjustment now is how do we approach the two strikes. But he is for a lot of thump. I, I was impressed. So yep. I, I loved having him on. That was a great time. Um, really appreciate Robbie again for coming on. Uh, gentlemen, let's get to our final thoughts. Joel, we'll start with you. Robbie Glendening's accent was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I have Australian accents to the best. So when he came on and started talking, I was like, yes, all right, this is going to be great. And it's going to be great for our listeners. Cause even if you're not a bit, you're a very casual baseball fan. Let's listen to dude talk about with an Australian accent. It's perfect. I was 
thrilled because I was like low key, like fingers crossed um, that it was going to have an Australian accent. Like hopefully he hasn't become Americanized and lost that. So I was low key in the back of my head, like, please haven't lost your accent yet. So I, I agree, Joel, that was, that was a, like, a, I was, I've seen it yeah, uh, for, for Collingwood. He, um, he grew up in Texas, went to Oklahoma state, and then he ended up going and playing footy for, for them. And now he has this weird Texas Australian hybrid, and it's hilariously awesome. That is amazing. He's in that, like he's been there for like six years now, so he he became a citizen and like has an Australian accent now. That's I quite to, a that's quite that. a hybrid. Yeah, I need to hear that. A little, little bit that. of southern yeah. drawl with the the Australian accent. It's it's pretty funny. Hmm. That's amazing. Josh, any final thoughts tonight? Uh, something I wanted to bring up in the minor league minute, if we had time, was uh, Jackson Kowar. Uh, up to three starts in Omaha, 12 and a third innings pitch, 16 earned, 19 hits, five walks, six strikeouts. Can we not Opponents talk are about averaging? It? Remember last week when I said I, I would mute him if I ever had the ability? Now I do. Now I've got the authority. We had a great interview. Vibes were positive. Everybody's feeling good. And here comes Josh just shitting on the parade. You know what, Josh? You're muted. I might not even let you finish this thought. He's calling for a timeout. He looks like he wants to like redeem himself. Josh, we were having a good night. Everybody was being positive, and you wrecked it. So I'm, I'm going to unmute you. If we start getting negative again, we're going straight into tickets for less thing. Where would you put Kowar in the prospect rankings right now? Well, now who's the positive negative one guy? I, I turned in the tables. My how the turntables. Probably 12. Yeah. I think he's most likely a re reliever now, but I'm like, I'm also like torn between like what I saw at AAA last year. I can't yeah. get out of my head and yeah. people like at the same time that people want to discount what Prado and Melendez did because of the super happy fun ball is the same ball. Coar was shoving it up hitters behinds with. Yeah. Like he was dominant in, in a way we haven't seen much of at triple a for a kid, his age with the super happy fun ball. I can't get it out of my mind. Like I know he's been yeah. bad, but I can't get the good out. So I don't know what to do with him. I don't know if it's the Royals fault. I don't know if he's got the yips. I don't know, man. He's I just, not striking dudes out. It's just I think, I, I, th I think it's the unspeakables. I think that's, that's what it is right now. Could be. Well, just on a positive note, small one, the India, the Northwest Arkansas bats are just on fire right now, and I just cannot get over how much I love how balanced that lineup is. You're not relying on yes. Matias being like the middle of the order guy. You pop him in the six hole, second cleanup. It's just balanced top to bottom, and I love watching it. My final thought of the night, uh, we are giving away a Billy Butler autographed jersey. So, if you want to win the Billy Butler autographed jersey, I already left you steps one and two on Twitter. You got to retweet the tweet and you got to subscribe to the podcast. Here's how, excuse me, here's how you can win. Screenshot that you have subscribed to the podcast and screenshot you listening to this podcast right around the hour mark ish is where we're at. So, right around the hour mark, screenshot it that you heard this, that you listened to it. Reply to that tweet on Twitter, and you will enter for a chance to win the Billy Butler autograph, uh, autographed jersey. It is a majestic. It's an old uh, powder blue uh, Billy Butler autograph. I think my dad got that jersey autographed in Anaheim during the 20 – no, yes, in Anaheim during the 2014 playoff run. So um, pretty cool thing that he was cleaning out his closet. He's like, hey, if you want to you – know, he's like, if you want it, he's like, or – I was like – care if I you know use that for some clout on the podcast and he said absolutely not so very cool of him to to donate that for us so Billy Butler autograph uh feel free to get in on the giveaway if you'd like uh Joel really quick you mentioned you're going to the game tomorrow I was at the game on Sunday I know Josh have you been to a game this year yep I, I went to a game a couple weeks ago we would all agree best place to get get your tickets is tickets for less right yep tickets for less.com Great place to get your tickets. They've got the best deals. We will have a, a KCSN uh, discount code coming out here soon for tickets for less. So that's where I go every time. I know people use StubHub. The fees and the stuff that people run on StubHub is so expensive. 
that I don't I won't shop there anymore. So use tickets and for less. And tickets for less is a local company too, so it's even better. It's rooted here in the Kansas City area. So use tickets for less. Buy your Royals tickets on tickets for less. I know the Royals are charging you an upstanding amount for parking. Park somewhere else and walk into the stadium with your tickets from tickets for less. So um did we hit all the people who are paying us to our missus? <laughs> I think we've hit, I think we've covered all our bases here. Full disclosure. For less, KCSC Drum Farm. We appreciate all of you. Thanks to KCSN for picking us up this year. Thanks to BJ, who was on the other side of the green room for a little bit, helping us get started. Thanks to Robbie Glendening for joining us tonight. Josh, Joel, thank you both. I appreciate you. We will see you guys again next week. Um, hopefully with an interview uh, for the first time about the MLB draft on the other side of the minor league minute. So we will see you all again very soon.